So uh, please welcome the director of Cartel Land, Matthew Heineman. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, the level of access in this movie is really amazing. I mean, within the opening minutes, we meet people who are in the process of making meth. So talk a little bit about getting access to that world and how you happened upon it. So to me, access is, is everything. You know, there's been a lot of films about the drug wars. There's been a lot of articles, you know, TV shows. Um, I really wanted to sort of put myself right in the heart of it. Um, and tell you know an action-driven verite uh, film, and so you know getting access to this world was the hardest part. Um, and you know there's two stories obviously: the vigilantes on the Arizona in the, on the Arizona side, and the vigilantes on the Mexican side. Um, on the Arizona side, it was, took sort of months and months of talking to them to gain uh, their trust. Mexico, um, which happened after filming Arizona for a while. Uh, I actually read about the doctor and called him up, uh, got his email, uh, set up a phone call, and I said, you know, I want to come down and, and film you and, and this, this movement, the citizen movement of, of uh, this group of auto defenses who are rising up against the Knights Templar cartel. And he said, come on down. And I think the key, especially on the Mexican side, was time. You know, I spent almost nine months down there. Uh, one to two weeks of every month and developed like really deep relationships with people on all sides of the issue. Uh, people who were cooking meth, people who were, um, you know, the good guys and the bad guys. And, and how long did you spend overall on the, on the project? About a year of shooting and about six to eight months of editing. Um, so what's interesting about that is that there, it's, it's a huge world that you're capturing, and it's not just the Mexican side, it's also on the other side of the border with these people who sort of take up arms to protect U.S. soil in the ways that they think they need to. With all of that stuff in play, how did you go about sort of focusing in on these really specific characters? And tell us a little bit about who those characters are. Yeah, I think part of the film for me was sort of what drives men and women to take up arms. You know, we've seen this story sort of play out throughout history of, of, of armed groups rising up to protect their families, to protect their communities. And so um, I really wanted to make a character-driven film. And so I was very focused in, in, in sort of capturing uh, the journeys of the leaders of these two groups. On the Arizona side, it's Tim Naylor Foley, who's an American veteran. Um, on the Mexican side, it's El Doctor Morelos, a, a small town surgeon who is leading this vigilante movement. They're both 55 years old. Uh, they both believe that the government has failed them. And they both, quote unquote, taken the law into their own hands to fight for what they believe in. The circumstances are quite different. In Mexico, uh, the violence is visceral, it's real. Uh, s roughly 80,000 people killed since 2007. 20,000 plus people disappeared since 2007. Whereas in Arizona, the violence is more theoretical. It's a fear that these Mexican drug wars will seep its way across our border. And you see the dysfunction as well on both sides, the way in which people who take up arms end up facing opposition from the very people they want to protect. How did you sort of insert yourself into all this stuff? And did you ever find yourself taking sides? It, I don't know. It was definitely the hardest film I've ever made, and I, I can't imagine I'll, make, uh, I'll ever have to make something that this hard. It was so difficult to make because you never knew. Um, the story was constantly evolving and changing. Uh, when I first stepped foot in Mexico, at least, I originally thought I was telling this very simple story, this in, in like the sort of classic Western sense of guys in white shirts, you know, fighting against guys in black hats. And very quickly, I realized that the story was much more complicated and that the lines between good and evil uh, were much more blurry than I thought. I could be, you know, you saw some of the footage in the, in the trailer, I could be on an operativo or on a mission in the back of a truck with these guys, and I really didn't know if I was with the good guys or the bad guys. Um, and that was scary. You know, I'm not a war reporter. I've never been in situations like this before. So it was a you know, really uh, frightening film to make. So we have a, uh, the first clip we want to take a look at. Is there anything you want to say just to kind I of... Think, so I think the first clip is a sort of introduction to El Doctor, uh, the leader of the vigilante group in, in Mexico. Let's take a look. Okay. 
a round of applause. It gives you a real sense of just how intense some of those scenes are. And I also wonder, I mean, when you were there and, and these guys were just taking the law into their own hands, essentially, did it feel like this was something appropriate that was taking place? Or did it, was there something kind of scary and, and ambiguous about, about the actions that they were taking there? It was incredibly scary and ambiguous. I mean, as a human, you know, it's a really difficult film because you, as a human being, sort of were constantly questioning what was happening. Um, you know, there were scenes uh, like that one and, and, and other scenes that, that are, are happen right after the scene, you know, where I'm in the back of a car as someone's getting interrogated with a gun, you know, shoved in their face. And as a human being, you're, you, you feel incredibly uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, my job is not there to police. My job there was not there to stop what's happening. It's to uh, bear witness and to capture, you know, these, this very uncomfortable, murky world that, that these people were living in. And what I sort of reaction did you get from them? I mean, were they happy that you were making a movie about what they were doing? I think it's always the sort of same common denominator, whether you're, you know, they're filming with vigilantes or in a hospital like my last film is, um, people want their story to be told. And I, th I feel like they um, wanted other people to understand what they were going through. I think it's important to recognize that this movement and these, especially here in Mexico, um, was born out of a place where you know, government institutions had failed. They really were living in this lawless world with no one to turn to. The, the very government institutions that are there to protect them either weren't there or are often colluding with the cartel. And so you, you really, like, you know, there's a, a young woman that we spent time with uh, in the beginning of the film, and you see her briefly in the uh, trailer yelling at the soldiers. Her whole family was murdered by the cartel. And, you know, we were one of the first people she, she told. She, could, she couldn't go to the police. She was too scared. And this had happened almost six months earlier. Um, you know, she was too scared that the police were either paid by the cartel or working with the cartel. And so, you just, at every moment, you're sort of looking over your shoulder, wondering, you know, <laughs> who's around you and, and who you're with. Um, but what's, what's not in the movie? I mean, you, you're, we're, we're so up close with these very particular figures. I mean, were there aspects of that world that you, you thought about and decided not to include for various different reasons? I think we included most of what uh, you know, I thought was important to show with this film. Um, you know, there's obviously some pretty intense scenes in the film uh, and you know, scenes of, of torture and um, you know, those, those are very difficult sort of moral questions that we sort of uh, asked ourselves uh, and debated for hours and hours on end in the edit room of, of whether it's okay to include this. Um, and ultimately, you know, we felt like we, you know, we felt that we had a responsibility to show what was really happening, uh, what sh to show what really happens when citizens sort of take the law into their own hands. I guess just to pivot off of that, the movie premiered at Sundance almost six months ago. Has anything in terms of the situation with this particular battleground changed much since then? You're going to make me give away the ending, Eric. Well. Uh, Let's not get into too many details. Let's say, put it in these terms. What is the status of the war on drugs from your perspective, having gone through this experience? Um, and, and do you see any kind of possibility of, of progress on that front? To try to answer both questions, uh, I think, unfortunately, you know, I'm an eternal optimist. I believe in the goodness of humanity. Uh, but I, I think that this problem is cyclical. Um, I think that once you remove one bad actor, um, and what we, what, we, what we saw in the journey of making this film is that as the vigilantes successfully got rid of the cartel, they created a power vacuum. And within this power vacuum, somebody needed to fill it. So that actually is a good lead up for the other clip we have. Do you want to set the stage at all? So, well, there's a whole saga as to how we got into the meth lab, which we can maybe talk about after. But this, this, this scene that I think we're about to see is the opening to the film uh, in a meth lab in the middle of the desert of Mexico. Check it out.
You know, it's an amazing way to start this odyssey. So tell us, how did you get into that meth lab? Um, the minute I stepped foot in Mexico, I, I wanted to get into a meth lab. Meth was the lifeblood of the cartel, is their cash cow, and I would literally ask every single person I met, you know, do you know somebody, know somebody, know somebody to get in? You know, every day I'd sort of ask my team, to my small team that we had on the, on the ground down there, to try to sort of make inroads. And uh, about halfway through filming, about four or five months in, we, we, found, we met somebody who, who said they could get us in. And he sort of promised me and said, you know, next shoot or tomorrow, and, and it just never happened. And so despite investing all this time, uh, I sort of gave up on it, just because it didn't seem like it was going to happen. And it was on our, our second to last shoot, uh, one of those days when like nothing was going right, and uh, our car broke down in the Sierra up in the mountains. And we got this call saying, uh, come to this town square at 6 p.m. and you're in. And we went there and there's a group of masked men um, who said, we're going to lead you into the lab. And they drove us through these towns and smaller towns and fields and stopped in the middle of the field and said, we're here to provide protection. And another car slowly drove up and then that car led us into the lab. How did they know you weren't a cop or something? Uh, so the first thing that they said, well, first of all, they're all armed to the teeth. And right when we get out of the car, the head chef you know, asked me, who sent you here? And I told him the name and he said, all right, let's go. And I dreamed of shooting the scene for months. I, you know, every night when I went to bed, I'd sort of, I'd, I'd, I just really wanted to get the scene. And I'd always envisioned, I'd never seen Breaking Bad, but I've always envisioned it as this sort of like, uh, like halogen lit trailer. And so when we got there, you know, we're in the middle of this forest with, and I don't shoot with lights. So I was sitting there, it's pitch black and I don't have any lights, and I was like, screwed, you know, how was I going to get this? And I was just like so pissed at myself that we come this far. And so the head chef starts showing me around the lab with this little flashlight. And it's with that little flashlight that I lit the scene. Um, so. And were you surprised that they opened up to you like that? I was surprised. I mean, I think, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you sort of, have to rely on the documentary gods uh, to deliver you um, good characters every now and then. And that head, the head chef, who, who's the guy that we interviewed, uh, was an amazing character. Um, Has he seen the movie, as far as you know? I, well, the f film is being released tomorrow in Mexico and Friday here in the States. So we haven't been able to stay in touch with him, unfortunately. So I don't, um, I don't know exactly where he is right now but I'm sure he's probably somewhere in the woods still cooking meth. Right. I have to say, you're overdue to watch Breaking Bad, my friend. I am overdue. I am overdue. Which opens up an interesting question about sort of the understanding, at least in this part of the world, of the situation depicting this movie. It couldn't be more different. I mean, certainly, you know, on a show like Breaking Bad, the Mex Mexicans are the bad guys, and they're kind of reduced to what you might expect, even if it is, you know, involving and thrilling in different kinds of ways. So. Having gone through all this experience, you come back and, and you're on U.S. soil. Do you ever get frustrated with the ways in which the drug war is understood through more simpler prisms? Yeah, I, I think we all in life, in film, in media in general, we all want to put everyone in a neat box. We want to put issues into a neat box. You know, those are the good guys, those are the bad guys. Um, and to me, that what what really drove me into making this film was understanding the complexity of uh, all of us. You know, you're complex, I'm complex, they're complex, and I really wanted to sort of be uncomfortable in this in this gray area, which is what this world is. And you know, they're all when you spend time with the meth cooks, you know, they view themselves as farmers. They're cultivating a crop. It just so happens that the crop is meth. It just so happens that the crop makes its way northward and ruins people's lives. But for them, they're just getting by. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of scenes in the film that I think make people feel uncomfortable. Uh, there's things that happen to some of our main characters that um, change your perception of them. Um, 
certain people get have you know gotten mad at me for oh I thought this guy was this and then you and then you show me that he's that and I, I really wanted to show um, the complexity of each of our characters and their decisions. So before we go to an audience Q and A, it's, it's a really fascinating way of putting it. Um, one of the names that stands out in the trailer is Catherine Bigelow. So tell us a little bit about how that connection happened, how she got, became aware of this project and so forth. Yeah, so after the film premiered at, at Sundance, um, Catherine saw the film. Um, we were connected and I went out to LA to meet with her and she just really was moved by the film. Um, I'm a huge fan of hers. I'm a huge fan of her locker and Zero Dark Thirty. Um, and so, you know, through a series of conversations, decided to bring her on as an executive producer of the film to help promote the film, help raise the vis visibility of the film. And, you know, she's been wonderful to collaborate with. It's certainly the kind of movie that we'd like to see her keep making. So anything that gets that name out there is a good thing as well. So let's uh, open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Why was it important to, bo to show both the Texas side and the Mexican side? Uh, uh, and then the other thing is, um, I remember uh, just recently, uh, I can't think of his first name, but Winslow, the writer that documents... Don, Don, Don Winslow. ...saying that the uh, war against drugs is a useless war to be fighting, and uh, where do your, how do your feelings lie in that discussion, in that debate? So two questions there. Um, so to answer your first question, this parallelism fascinated me. Um, you know, the idea of, of men and women sort of taking up arms fascinated me. I constantly ask myself, and I want the audience to ask themselves, you know, what would you do, what would you do if violence came knocking at your front door? What would you do if, if your sister was raped or your brother was hanging from a bridge at the hands of the cartel? Would you take up arms? Would you fight violence with violence? Uh, is that just? Is that right? Is vigilantism sustainable? These are questions that sort of plagued me and drove me, and I, I almost became obsessed uh, with trying to understand who these guys really were and what was really happening. Um, I think my, my girlfriend and my family thought I was somewhat sick um, <laughs> for continuing to go down there as, as much as I did. Um, that was question one. I'm not, I have a terrible memory. Question number two was... The Don Winslow. Don Winslow. Uh, Look, Don Winslow is way smarter than I am. There's a lot of people out there who are making, you know, studying policy. I, I really, my last film was about healthcare in the U.S. and it was a policy film. For this film, I really didn't want to make a policy film. I didn't want to make a film with talking heads. I didn't want to make a film with experts. I didn't want to make a film talking to government officials. I wanted to tell this story through the eyes of the people living, this, living in this world. Um, that being said, you know, I think Going back, and going back to what Eric said, I mean, it's a cyclical problem. It's, you know, it's basic you know, economics, supply-demand. As long as there's a demand for drugs up here, there'll be a supply for drugs coming from Mexico and South America. And that cycle will continue, and drugs will keep moving northward until it stops. So, and, and the violence associated with that will continue. And until government institutions in Mexico um, take care of people, um, you know, Corruption, collusion with the cartels uh, will continue. So, I mean, it's a, it's a really complicated issue, a really complicated problem, and there's other films and other journalists and, and storytellers that are examining those issues. So, but I really wanted to tell this story through the eyes of the, of the people who are affected by the violence and, and the reaction of people rising up to fight up against it. And it is in a political move. I mean, like I was saying before, it's, 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 so, it's so thrilling just to see it on the ground in some ways it reminds people that there is this world beyond the headlines and the analysis that is actually putting lives in danger. I mean, I mean that's, you, I say that often, I mean you took the words out of my, I, I always say like I, I really wanted to get beyond the headlines. I wanted to sort of show what's happening to everyday people and um, I think as Americans we, you know, we talk about ISIS, we talk about all these conflicts all around the world but there's this war that's happening in Mexico, in a country that we share so much history with, that we share so much, um, that we share a border with. And I don't think we necessarily recognize that. So that's a world that I wanted to examine. Hello. Uh, my question is, was there any point in time where you felt like this is just way too dangerous? 
you had your curiosities and you wanted to make sure that you shared this story with millions of people. But was there any point in time where you just felt like this is just way too dangerous and I'm kind of in over my head? Uh, every day. <laughs> yeah, as I said, you know, I'm not a war reporter and I've never been in situations like this before. And so it was frightening. It was a frightening film to make. And I, you know, as you see, I, I was in shootouts, I was in meth labs, I was in places of torture. Those are all really scary places to be. But for me, the scariest moment was to some time I spent with a young woman uh, who was kidnapped by the cartel, whose husband was chopped up to pieces in front of her and, and burned to death. And to see this woman that was right in front of me and to look into her eyes that were so deeply hollow, almost as if her soul had been sucked out of her, and to think that we're the same species of human beings that would do that to other people, and to, and to sort of, and, and her, and this, this happens in the film, her, her, her punishment uh, was to live. That's what the cartel, cartel said to her. Her punishment was to live and be crazy for the rest of her life. And, and that, that stuck with me much more so uh, psychologically than any of the sort of um, more intense, like adrenaline-filled moments that are in the film. And we also see the perpetrators and then, and then there's a scene, you know, right afterwards in which the auto defenses capture the two assassins that committed this crime, so her, committed these crimes, uh, uh, and killed her husband. So it was, it was a very emotional, intense scene uh, that we captured. Thank you. This seems to have been focused primarily in the state of Michoacan. Is it isolated to that particular area, or is it widespread through all of Mexico? It's a good question. Uh, you know, there's violence. Uh, first of all, cartels are all throughout Mexico, and violence, you know, exists all throughout Mexico. Um, Tamaulipas, uh, Nuevo León. There's, you know, these are border cities. There's, you know, extreme violence happening right now. There are actually auto defensive groups similar to this that are rising up to sort of protect their towns. And, and um, I think there's, there was something particularly evil about the Knights Templar cartel um, in the state of Michoacan. They had this very bizarre sort of pseudo medieval Christian belief that they, they came into town, they came into power. Um, there's some kids here, so I don't want to say. There's some, they came in in a very violent way um, and professed to be bring safety and security to the people of Michoacan against the evil government. Um, and they, they ruled through fear. They ruled through violence. But they also ruled through extortion. They extorted people from local tortilla makers to multinational corporations. If you go out tonight and have dinner, the limes that you have in your mojito are most likely coming from Michoacan. The avocados that you're having in your tacos are most likely are coming from, from Michoacan. It's an incredibly rich area. Um, and they ruled, you know, they were the, they were the government, they were, the, they were taxing the people, they um, committed horrible atrocities to very innocent people. And, and that's, you know, how they exerted their power. And that's why this movement rose up. After, after years of dealing with this, everyday citizens rose up to fight up against it. And, but obviously the film evolves into um, something different as well, so. Hello. Can you talk about Morales? Uh, can you talk about his character and like his daily life and the fears that he had or just anything that you picked up from talking with him? Do you, do you know about him? Do you know about no, him? No, I don't know oh. about him. I'm, I'm really interested in his character though and who he is and, but yeah. Well, go see the film when it opens in, in theaters on Friday. But uh, he's a, he was a small town physician in, in, from the town of Tepecatepec in Michoacan, uh, who along with a group of other people, you know, rose up to start this movement. Um, during their first battle, their first um, fight against the, the Templars, uh, 
he's, he's about 6'2", he's way taller than most people there, and everyone was wearing masks. And so after, after they won this battle and they're sort of congratulating each other, they all went up to him and said, you know, hey, doctor, it's good to see you. Like, because he, they all recognize him as the tall town doctor. And so he's like, screw it, I might as well take my mask off. And he sort of became the de facto spokesman for the movement. And he rose uh, and let, led this movement. Um, halfway through filming, uh, he got in a plane crash. That's a really pivotal uh, turn in his life and pivotal turn in the movie. Uh, and in some ways, sort of the beginning of the end of the movie. Um, I don't want to give too much more away, but hopefully you can see the film. Um, but he's an incredibly charismatic, fascinating, deeply complex person. Um, um, as an outsider coming in who is, as you said, very frightened of the whole situation, did you ever feel like they were manipulate, uh, yeah, manipulating you with their own sort of agenda as to what kind of story to tell, or was it sort of you had full freedom? Like, was there anything that you didn't get to see, you think, that could have changed your opinion of them? It, it's hard to talk about without seeing the film. Um, one of the things, and when I first stepped foot in, in, in Mexico, in Michoacan, was I said, I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to document this sort of historical uh, revolution. And, and so almost from day one, I started hanging, we started hanging out with people on all different sides. Without giving away too much of the movie, the movement starts to unravel. And by that time, I had already spent so much time with all the different sides that um, I was able to continue to spend time with them. Um, and that was, that was also scary because, you know, it's a small world. Everyone knew what was happening. Uh, I was known as El Gringo. Uh, and so, you know, I could be spending time with one character in the morning and then I'd get a text saying, hey, I heard you were with, uh, what's his name this morning? And, you know, um, so it was, a, it was a really morally, intellectually, emotionally complex story to sort of piece together because, um, yes, the, I mean, people wanted their version of the truth told. Um, and so, you know, it was my job to sort of navigate those, those murky waters and to present the story as, as honestly as I, as I could. And, and hopefully the result is um, both an emotional and, and uh, complex moral uh, adventure, so. So the movie opens in New York this weekend. It opens in LA next weekend. It's what opens. It's at uh, IFC Center uh, in Lincoln Plaza this weekend. If you want to go check it out, and then spreading out through the country uh, over the next couple of weeks. So. And guys, I know there's a new Terminator movie coming out, but this is the action adventure movie you should go check out. Believe me. Thanks for being here. Thanks <laughs> Thank for you, sticking Eric. around.